I'm really excited to have Nadine Weggie with me today. She is a certified athletic trainer and practices functional physical therapy. So thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you got started with athletic training and physical therapy. Uh, that's a great question. So I, I grew up in Northern Michigan, um, very much involved with uh, outdoor recreation and um, team sports. And I got injured a lot when I was in high school. I think, you know, part of it was growing pains and um, part of it was being a daredevil doing a variety of things. Um, but I had quite a few injuries. And when I was injured enough where it would limit my function or it was necessary that I needed to go to the doctor, um, you know, I'd go see the general practitioner or whatever. And it was, I was like, oh, you're a kid, you sprain something, it'll get better. And that was it. And never was referred to physical therapy or referred to having anybody help me ever. It was just like suck up the pain and it'll get better in a few days or a few weeks. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And that was a little frustrating for me, especially when it came to sports participation or doing activities I like to do and then not being able to do them for a little while. Um, so I got interested in the field of athletic training, which didn't really exist in a small town in Northern Michigan. <laughs> we didn't have an athletic trainer for the school or anything like that. Um, so I did a little bit of research and it's pre-internet. So there was, you know, some effort, but I watched a lot of sports on TV and you would see somebody get injured. The athletic trainer would run out to the field or the court or whatever and, and help them. Um, so I became interested in doing that. And, um, when I was looking to apply to graduate school, or excuse me, to undergraduate school, um, I loved science and was interested in science and thought, oh, sports medicine would be a cool thing to go into. So I looked, you know, um, applied to school and looked for programs related to pre-med thinking, oh, I'm going to be a sports medicine doctor that actually helps people instead of just sending kids home. Um, and once I got into um, undergrad and started um, classes, I, uh, I don't want to say I volunteered, but I was very interested in athletic training. So I ended up taking a job as a student athletic trainer for my college, um, which was awesome. And because I went to a small college, a private school, we didn't, we had one head athletic trainer and the rest were all student athletic trainers, but we had every sport and competed at division two. So um, it was a little baptism by fire. They needed all the help they could get. So I got to start working with the teams, um, you know, pretty much my sophomore year, which is when I decided to, to kind of do that job on campus um, and, and worked alongside the sports medicine physicians and got to talk to them and kind of got to really work with that. And I, and I discovered again that the sports med docs, you know, if you didn't need surgery, didn't do anything, right? Oh, you're not surgical, go to PT or it'll just get better. And so um, I thought, well, I really like athletic training because I get to work with the athletes. I get to see them when they get injured. I get to help them immediately with the first aid or you know emergency care um, and then help them through their rehab and their sports training and everything they needed to get back into competition. And um, so I was really interested in that. And so I thought, okay, I'm not gonna go to medical school because I don't actually get to do anything <laughs> in terms of helping the athletes or you don't really get to know your patients very well you know there are some exceptions in medicine but generally speaking particularly in sports medicine you see them when they're injured then you send them off to somebody else to get better and that's about it um, so just thought I'm going to do athletic training um, and then I did a couple internships I did an internship at University of Michigan through their med sport department um, you know got exposed to a few more things worked with um, some professional teams and and again, I was like, okay, as an athletic trainer, I like it. There's a lot I can do, but there's a few things that I'm limited as an athletic trainer that I don't, I'm not going to learn the skills to do if I stay in this field. So that's when I decided to go to graduate school for physical therapy so that I could learn 
more of the manual therapy skills, um, the, the hands-on stuff. And as an athletic trainer, you get some of that, but not to the depth and breadth of what I was really interested in doing, realizing that if I really knew how to do spinal um, mobilization or manipulation, that that could be really important. And in athletic training, you don't always have the luxury of that because it's more like triage. Um, so yeah, so I went to grad school for uh, physical therapy, um, which was a three-year program, which I hated every day of. <laughs> um, I, was, I didn't care for the way the program was run. It was frustrating. And going into that back in the, in the mid-90s, um, physical therapists didn't like athletic trainers. So um, uh, it was a competition thing. So kind of going into that program... Um, you know, everyone's like, well, you can't just automatically assume you want to work in sports. You're going to have to tie up, try all these other types of physical therapy. And I was like, but I'm already a certified athletic trainer. Cause I sat and took the national board exam, you know, I was like, and I know I want to go into sports. So like, why do you have to give me a hard time about it? So it was kind of interesting, but I made it through and, um, then went on to do continuing education throughout my career, which we have to do. Um, every profession I think generally has to do that. And, um, so really got more and more niche and specific into sports and functional movement. And, um, and then I went through Michigan state's, um, continued medical education on, um, osteopathy and so use my hands a lot um so that's kind of my background in terms of how I got into helping other people like me that were injured not falling apart but needed a little care yeah I think your story is you know one of many people and athletes and it's the reason why they go into the healthcare field and For sure. is the reason why I'm going into it too is that when you're either like an active person or an athlete and you experience the frustrations and the struggles of continuously getting injured and doctors either saying, you know, just take two weeks off, you'll be fine. Or, you know, just giving you these like very basic exercises and you feel like your body needs more and that there must be something else, but no one's providing that to you. And when that leads into career ending injuries, I mean, that's a really big deal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, it's not. And I've met a lot of people like me, exactly like you're saying, right, where, you know, and I wasn't this elite high level athlete, but I am still an active person. Right. And I, you know, like I said, I'm outdoor wreck, you know, I skied a ton, I skied competitively all growing up and loved it. And I broke, I did gymnastics and I broke my foot actually five times, but Two, two years in a row when I was in high school doing gymnastics and I couldn't get my foot into my ski boot. Right. And, um, and so I could put weight on it, but I, but I couldn't get my foot and it ruined my skiing. Right. I didn't really care that much about gymnastics, but I wanted to be able to, to do my downhill skiing. So, you know, those are the kind of things, yeah, that can change your mindset or change your direction of your life. So I yeah. get it. <laughs> Can you also uh, give a brief definition of the difference between an athletic trainer and a physical therapist? Because I know some people may not know the little nuances between the two of them. Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, and uh, I'm not super prepared from a you know textbook answer for that. Um, so certified athletic trainer is a healthcare profession. Um, it is now in the United States, a graduate school. Um, they're, they just transitioned from being an undergraduate degree to only master's degrees or PhDs um, or doctorate degrees in that. Um, so athletic trainers are I think I, well, the way that I describe it to a lot of lay people or people that don't work in sports or don't have that background is that it's kind of a combination between like an EMT, a PT, and, and like a PA. Um, so athletic trainers are trained in um, uh, emergency medicine to some extent. So really being able to recognize um, acute um, injuries and then treat them. And then uh, specifically to sport, understanding what the needs are for an athlete to get back to their sport from a strength and agility and all of those kind of things, um, that perspective. So um, uh, athletic trainer provides a lot of the care that's necessary from exercises to modalities to um, some extent, some sports psychology, right? Understanding the mindset of an athlete and being able to work with them uh, as part of their recovery and then helping them transition back on to the field. So um, kind of everything from the moment of injury until the return to sport, athletic trainers kind of know the, the gamut. Um, uh, and, and with that, uh, you know, depending on the, on the athletic training and the extent of their education in the, in the um, setting that they work in, you can be somewhat niche or more specific or expert in one area more than another. But uh, for the most part, you know, it's understanding biomechanics, it's understanding sports psychology, it's understanding um, uh, 
physi cellular physiology as well as exercise physiology, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, in physical therapy, you need to know a lot of that, but it's not necessarily specific to um, athletes. So uh, as a physical therapist, generally speaking, unless you work in a sports environment, you're not seeing the acuteness of an injury, right? You're not, you don't watch somebody get injured. You see them after they've been injured. Maybe they've gone to the emergency room or seen the doctor, and then they get referred to physical therapy to do the rehabilitation that it takes to get better. So there's a lot less acute care in, in the sense of injuries in, in physical therapy. Um, and then it's, uh, yeah, understanding the whole system. So having maybe a little bit more in-depth understanding of um, medical diagnoses. So, uh, you know, understanding if somebody's had a stroke or if they have, if they also have diabetes or, you know, those kind of things and how that impacts their overall ability to rehab from an injury or an illness. Um, and, and then following them through with the rehabilitation to a point that they're functional and pretty good. But again, not all PTs then work with that. Now we're gonna work on sports specific stuff and get you better to get you back on the field. You can, and some PTs do that, you know, again, depends on the setting, but that's not necessarily like the, um, the majority of PTs that do that um, as well. So not a great definition, but there's, there's, there are some differences. I would say that I know a lot more in terms of overall volume of information as an athletic trainer than I do as a physical therapist. Um, but I have more, much more specific skills as a physical therapist than as an athletic trainer. Great explanation. I think that was, you know, very clear to understand. And going off of that, what would be your recommendations? Let's say, you know, an athlete has just injured themselves. They went to their GP and they told them that they need to go see a professional to work on their injury. What certifications or qualifications would you say that athlete should look for in a healthcare professional to help them get great through question. their? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think it depends on a number of things, right? Where does that athlete live and what's available to them, right? So not every small town has an athletic trainer or physical therapist available. Um, you know, do they have health insurance? How much is this going to cost? There's so many factors that play into that. Um, you know, so if we kind of remove some of those things and say that this is a person that has, that lives in an area where everything is available to them and, you know, whether they pay out of pocket or health insurance or their team or whatever it's going to be paid for, um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, once you've been diagnosed and you don't necessarily need any specialty care from a medical doctor, that I would probably go to a sports medicine clinic, which likely has a physical therapist and athletic trainer on staff and maybe a strength and conditioning coach on staff as well. Um, and so kind of starting out with your PT for the more um, injury side of it, kind of some of your um, initial rehab type stuff and, and working through that and then getting back to a point where you can do everyday functional things, you know, like walking's back to normal or, you know, or whatever that is. Um, and then maybe working from a, t a team perspective with then the athletic trainer that's on site to be like, okay, let's now start working on more sports specific stuff, but still considering how your, this, your injury is impacted by what we're doing. Um, you know, and then also starting to pick up then working with a strength and conditioning coach to be doing a consistent pattern to work on uh, a level of fitness and strength and stuff like that. So, you know, in my opinion, a team approach is always best. And um, having, you know, grown up and, and initially started my career in the Midwest, that was pretty typical was that we generally had multiple disciplines that work together um, to provide the most effective and efficient um, treatment for our athletes. Um, in the different places that I've lived, and I, I currently now live in Northern California, um, it's a lot of competition. And so very rarely do I actually see different disciplines work together in one setting. Now, like for me personally, I refer out and I have a network. So I, I'm duly certified so I can do a lot, but I do work with some strength and conditioning coaches or personal trainers. I work a lot with actual sport coach specific to what the athlete needs to get their technique back for their sport. Um, I refer to acupuncture, chiropractic, you know, I, I am like, okay, whatever we need to do to make you whole and make you really perform. I want to pull all of those specialists in, um, and, you know, massage therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, PT, athletic training, strength and conditioning coach, you know, medical doctor, sports psychologist, you know, dietitian or new sports nutritionist, you know, whatever it takes. And I have a pretty decent knowledge of 
of a lot of things, but when somebody really needs something specific, if let's say they're really struggling with their nutrition to kind of get enough calories to help them, or if they have dietary restrictions, then I'm going to pull in an expert for that, you know? And so my recommendation to most athletes is to find somebody that has a pretty good knowledge base of how the system works that can then refer as needed to all of those different people. And I think you see athletic trainers generally have a little bit better idea of how all those things work together than a, than a physical therapist does. So. Yeah, I really like um, your approach to that because that's something that I felt when I was going to see a lot of physical therapists was that there was no communication Granted, like I had my own strength and conditioning coach through my sport, um, but there re really wasn't anything of like, what is your strength and conditioning coach's number? What's your coach's number? Let's get in contact. Let's see how we can all work together to help you along because I kind of felt like I was the middleman trying to explain to everyone what the other person was saying. And at that time, you know, I wasn't knowledgeable in the healthcare field. I didn't really know how to explain things, what was going on inside of me. And I think that really hindered my healing process. Whereas if I had someone like you, for example, that has like a lot of connections, everyone's in contact together, everyone understands that it's a team effort and that we all work together for my health and well being, then I think that's a great way to speed up that process. Yeah, definitely. That, that multidisciplinary approach makes a huge difference in the. Um, the time, if nothing else, and how long it takes to get better. If you can kind of be hitting it from all angles and really work on that, then recovery is usually faster. For anybody that's looking into going into, we'll just call it sports medicine for a general umbrella, there are so many disciplines, right? There's so many different specialties that you can have. And if you can, if there's a way that you can combine a couple, I think it just makes you um, a better practitioner in a way, in terms of just being able to provide a better resources to your, your clients, your athletes, your patients, whatever you want to call, you know, the people you serve. So I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that you train, um, or you help along a couple athletes. What would you say the most common injuries are for athletes that come in to see you? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think right now I work in a clinical setting, so I'm not, I'm not out on the sports field anymore or working with a particular team. So um, in the clinic, I, because I work outside of the system, so I don't, I don't work with health insurance or specifically within a, within a medical system or specific doctors that always refer to me. So people find me by word of mouth and I'm a referral based source only. Um, I tend to get people that didn't get better in the system. Um, so they've gone, you know, they got hurt. They went to their GP. Oh, you'll get better. Take out. They'll go home for two weeks. They don't get better. They go back, you know, six weeks later because they're still hurting. And then the GP's like, oh, let's do an x-ray now. Right. Or whatever. And, you know, and so it's, you know, four to six months later after whatever the onset of the injury was before they're not getting better, then they finally get referred to PT and, you know, and not to knock my own profession, but a lot of PTs, um, clinics that are in the system, it's like, well, we, we only get 20 minutes to see you because we got to see 85 people today or whatever it is. And so, you know, they'll check, oh, your range of motion is good. And here's some exercises. And then some PT tech is watching them do exercise. Well, they can do that at home. Right. And so they might get better. Sometimes people get better from that, but if they don't, you know, then it's on to the next thing. Well, I'm going to go find my own. I'm going to look online right? and then go, well, this person got better from a chiropractor. I'm going to go do that, you know, like whatever. So I, it, it takes a while before I get uh, people in to see me. Um, for chronic stuff. Um, and so that that's anything, right? That's, that can be, you know, an old shoulder injury that didn't heal, or it might be, um, you know, uh, spine stuff. If you're, that there's a facet joint dysfunction in the vertebra or the pelvis is out of whack. A lot, I see a lot of that. The sacroiliac joint is not lined up and that gets missed by almost every profession and that being off creates a, an unstable base. And so then you start to see muscle strains more frequently or wrist injuries or stuff like that. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, from a chronic perspective, or when I get people a lot later, um, it's kind of a, a big variety and it's layers upon layers. Our bodies are amazing compensators. So if you get injured, you know, any little thing, you know, as a species, we still needed to survive. We still needed to be able to run away from that jungle cat or from, you know, whatever it was. And so our body finds a way to compensate for it. And when you're an elite athlete, especially or a high level or a high functioning person, 
um, those little compensations allow you to continue to do your sport. And so you don't notice them so much. It might, maybe your, maybe your time, you know, in your, if you're in a time sport, like if you're a swimmer or runner or something, maybe you lose a, a second off of your time. And so you're frustrated. And you don't know why. And it's because your body's compensating for something that didn't work great. Um, and then you'll start to compensate for that compensation, right? And, and then you'll work harder. You'll do, train more in the gym. I must have to work harder to get back those two seconds I lost off of my time, whatever. And then you just, it, it compounds, right? You end up with all these layers of dysfunction. Um, and so when I get people in, I've got 25 layers of compensations that we got to work through to get back to the original injury. Um, so that's kind of a, one half of my clients. And then the other half are people that know me or that I, you know, have worked with me before. And so then as soon as they get injured, like I'm getting that phone call, like I'm not wasting my time going to the doctor who's going to tell me to take Advil and go home. Right. So, um, so I do see acute injuries and that, and that's a pretty good mix as well. I would say again, kind of almost sport dependent. Um, but I see, uh, for me, because I'm an osteopath, I always look at the spine. And um, so I always go there first and I'll see, you know, a variety of like small little dysfunctions and I'll correct those. And that oftentimes will get rid of the cause of other injuries. But, you know, I see a fair bit of wrist injuries, I would say shoulder injuries, um, and then the hip and pelvis stuff, you know, sometimes I'll get a, I'll just get a nice, easy, you know, ankle sprain. And not that that's a, a minor injury because they're actually very serious, but they're um, relatively simple to fix if you get at it, you know, right away. So, um, yeah, so I, I can't say that there's any one common injury, you know, there are definitely more common injuries with each type of sport or the demands of each sport um, that we'll see. What would you recommend as being some pre-rehab work? for athletes to take part in, you know, maybe they feel like something is coming up, but it doesn't necessarily like hurt them yet. Um, or just to make sure that no, they don't get those little aches and pains. Yeah, sure. When your maintenance is what we like to call it, yeah. right? Like, okay. Like I've been feeling really tight in my left hip. I'm not injured, but it's not quite normal. And when I'm out running yeah. or when I'm out do figure skating or whatever it is that you're doing, right? Like something doesn't feel right. And I, you know, and, but I don't want it to turn into an injury. Yeah. So I'll usually tell people if, if you have the luxury of the, of the time and the availability of the resources to, um, you know, that's when you definitely should go see your massage therapist. Uh, you know, do a little bit more of your own um, rolling or using your massage balls or the, the you know, the Theragun type things, uh, you know, and see if that does it. And if it doesn't, if it, the soft tissue doesn't seem like it clears it out, um, you know, maybe you do some soft tissue and some extra stretching. If that's not doing it, then I would definitely recommend that you go see some sort of a manual um, therapist. So whether that's a chiropractor or a PT, um, osteopath or something like that, to just see maybe there's just something just the tiniest bit out of whack or out of alignment um, that can, you know, before you start getting all those compensations or turn into an injury, yeah, addressing that as, as quickly as you can. Um, in general, I tell people, you know, if you get a niggle, well, something a little bit off, you know, a couple of days, no big deal. But if it's still there after like a week, unlikely that it's going to fix itself. So then it's worth at least trying to address it yourself, you know, through the stuff that you know, or going to see a massage therapist. And by the three week mark, if it hasn't cleared out, you really need to get it looked at by somebody that, that understands that because it's usually around that three week, week mark where you start to become much more susceptible to injury or compensations. And so you want, you don't want to let it go down that road where it's now going to take you eight weeks to get better instead of two. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the good thing about, you know, practitioners that don't work with insurance necessarily, because you do have the luxury of going to see them when something really isn't a problem yet. Let's say, like you said, you're just feeling some tightness in your hip. A lot of times if you go to a GP and you say, I have some tightness, they're not going to refer you to a physical right. therapist. Um, but if you do know someone who, again, doesn't work with insurance, you can then go to them and say, you know, this is feeling a little bit stiff, a little off. I don't want it turn to turn into something. And you can get that help a little bit earlier than you would normally. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there are benefits to the system, the healthcare system for sure. But yeah, especially as an athlete that, that's at a competing at a competition level or at a little bit of a higher level, um, you know, trying to wait and work in the system where, you know, and say, I don't want to have to pay for this myself. I want my insurance to pay for it. Well, good luck. I mean, you're not going to get that massage that you need or the PT that you need until eight weeks after your hip got tight. Oh, and, and then only if you're the one that's like really like 
calling the doctor and making sure that you're, you know, checking all the boxes and watching your timing. So yeah, I think there is a benefit to having your own resources or knowing your people that you can go to, that you can go see for those kind of things um, and understanding your own body, right? Some people can get one of those little kinks and know that it's going to be gone in three or four days and other people get it and they don't know what it's like and they, you know, freak out or it could turn into something or that has a tendency to turn into something that lasts longer. And then maybe they're not going to wait for four or five days. They're going to go right away and get it looked at. So, um, you know, kind of learning and understanding your own body is really um, key in terms of getting appropriate care that's effective. Yes, absolutely. And through everything that you've seen in your professional career, what would be some of your biggest points of advice for athletes in maintaining their body and just making sure that they are receiving the right care when they are injured? Yeah. Um, so a few things just for life in general, for, for human beings, you know, sleep, right? Making sure, you know, honestly, a minimum of seven hours of sleep for adults. Um, you know, kids need a lot more than that, but our bodies tell us when we need sleep. So making sure that we're sleeping in and, and if possible, you know, it's different for people that work swing shifts and, you know, have some other circumstances in life. Um, but you, you want to sleep according to the circadian rhythm, according to the sun, right? So being awake when it's daytime and being asleep when it's nighttime um, is huge because our body's hormones are all based on that. So how we create hormones, including the hormones that help us with sports performance, right, are really based on the cycle of the sun and the moon. So really understanding, you know, good quality sleep and going to bed, you know, relatively soon after it gets dark outside and then trying to be awake once the sun is up and, and just making sure that you're exposed to that light and darkness for um uh, for that purpose so adequate sleep is huge um fresh air so whether you're an indoor athlete outdoor athlete whatever like all of us need outside we need fresh air we need nature um every day if possible so at least finding um you know ideally 90 minutes to be outside in nature um because that's a grounding uh, one of our blood our blood cycle is 90 minutes roughly or the body goes through the our, the blood goes through the whole body and so if you can be in nature and getting the the frequency of the earth instead of the frequency of wi-fi and all the other things that we're surrounded by um that can be really helpful helpful in keeping and maintaining, um, again, you know, appropriate cellular physiology. So fresh air, you know, sleep, fresh air and adequate hydration, man, that's a big thing, you know, like, and it doesn't matter, I think, whether it's a really, you know, elite athlete or not, just too many people don't drink enough, right? And we need to drink water to hydrate our tissues, you know, muscle tissue that's dry doesn't work as well. If your fascia is really tight, you're not going to be able to move as well, you're going to get stiffer and whatnot. So uh, proper hydration in terms of how all those things work is really great, but then also proper hydration for detox, right? We need to drink so that we are excreting all of the crap that builds up in our body, right? Whether that's from bad food or, you know, lactic acid buildup, if you're doing, um, you know, an explosive sport, uh, you know, toxins from the environment, you know, whatever that is, like, you know, for example, swimming, right? It's great sport, great for your body, but you are in horrible chemicals all the time. And those chemicals are seeping into you and they're not natural right and so it can create all kinds of um, physiological health conditions right and so you know drinking a lot of water to detox is is huge and there are a variety of other things you can do to detox but yeah drinking water sleeping fresh air those are three really big things um, and then you know adequate recovery um, you know, recovery from activity, whether that's um, practice, you know, fitness session, competition, adequate recovery is actually your preparation for the next time you go to go out to do any kind of performance. So, um, you know, proper recovery is again, making sure you drink enough, you know, when you're finished. Um, usually eating within 30 minutes is really important to uh, restore muscle function um, and your um, your fuel that your body needs, you know, you're still actually burning fuel after sport or after uh, fitness activities. And so getting some nutrition in to help with that, um, you know, doing adequate warm down, you know, moving the body in a different way to kind of undo whatever stress you just put it through. So, um, you know, whether that's stretching, foam rolling, whatever that looks like. Um, I'm a big fan of contrast bath. Um, so doing the uh, warm, cold, warm cold showers or baths or the cold plunge or stuff like that, that can really help with recovery as well. So just making sure that part of your session, whether that's again, practice or fitness or competition, 
it's not over until you finish your recovery, right? So you might walk off the court or skate off the rink or whatever and think you're done and go get in the car and go home. <laughs> but there's a whole nother, I would say an hour after that of making sure you get some fuel, that you stretch, that you warm down, you know, you shower, you do all of those things. And if possible, trying to get a massage right away can be really helpful too. So um, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the ne necessities of life, which are the sleep, fresh air, um, hydration and then proper recovery. I'd, I'd say those are my biggest tips, um, you know, which are no brainers, but it's not some special thing, you know, it's not some crazy thing, but they really make a huge difference for athletic performance. Yeah, absolutely. I really like those tips, especially uh, the fresh air one, because I actually didn't know that your blood cycles 90 minutes. That's really interesting. Yeah, to hear on, on average, it's typical about 90 minutes. And then, you know, again, um, that what I call what's called grounding of connecting with the earth or nature. Um, in today's society, we're inside, right? I'm in my office right now. I'm underneath, it's actually LED, but fluorescent lights. You know, there's Wi Fi. I'm on Wi Fi with my computer right now. There's a variety of electronics plugged in, and all of those things are giving off electronic frequencies, right? Well, we work on electricity. So that a human's electrical frequency is about 7.83 hertz. And we actually get that between 7.83 and 10. We get that from the earth. And when you're in a metal box, like an airplane, or you're in a, like this building is metal and brick, right? Um, I'm not getting earth's frequency at all. I'm not getting anything from nature. So my body is trying to find 7.83 hertz when my computer is giving off 5,000 hertz, you know, or whatever. So um, being able to connect in nature actually helps get your body ha having to work less hard to find that normal electrical frequency. And your um, blood actually, the, the little blood cells and how they flow through the, um, the vessels, um, they get clumped together and they don't work as well when you're around a foreign electricity all the time, right? All these different electrical fields. And so when you actually can get your body back down to that 10 Hertz or whatever, really connecting through the earth, the blood cells separate and they, and they flow more freely. And so when you have all the surfaces of a single blood cell open, it can get the nutrition that it needs versus when they're all clumped together, you're not actually getting proper nutrition. So it makes a huge difference in overall health to have that fresh air and get like, again, kind of connect with the earth and just get outside of the um, man-made electrical fields that exist. Yeah, very interesting. Would you recommend walking around barefoot outside or it doesn't really make a difference? Yeah, definitely. If you can, if you can get in actual nature and connect with earth, like actual soil, um, that is going to be most beneficial. Um, so yeah, if you can get barefoot and get on grass or, you know, if you, if you have a sport that allows you access to outside, you know, if there's a, a sport field nearby or a park or your own lawn in your yard or something um, to get outside and actually be on earth while you're doing your warm up or your recovery or something like that can be really, really huge in terms of that. Um, I'm also a big fan of the beach because then you also have the magic of water, which is also really good for our soul, if nothing else. Um, so you're connecting with the earth, you know, through the sand and through the water and you have all the diatoms coming out of the ocean or whatever that is. So there's a lot of benefit to that too. So yeah, the more of your actual physical being that you can connect to actual nature um, points can be a big difference. So um, like for myself, I'll try to just lay in grass, like just my whole body laying in grass if I can for anywhere from a half hour up to 90 minutes. Um, if I can once a week, I wish I could do that every day. It doesn't work in my schedule great and um, you know, weather dependent uh, if I wanna sit out in the rain or not, but I try to get outside if I can every day for a little while and then really do some big connection points a couple times a week if I can. Yeah, wow. I'm definitely going to try and start implementing that. And uh, going back to what you said about the ocean, I think I read that the ocean's the world's biggest source of magnesium. I know a lot of people are deficient in magnesium, so that can help with a variety of things, recovery, sleep, uh, depression, anxiety. So that's a good thing. Mental health, doing. exactly. Being around water is huge. And, and, I'll, and I'll make one more point because I just thought of this when you said that. Um, a lot of athletes uh, fly or travel like pretty long distances. So I used to work in professional tennis. And so I literally was on an airplane once about every 10 days and uh, on a different continent and wherever I was going. And when you're in an airplane, you are subjected to horrible fumes. You're around jet fuel. You are in an, literally in a Faraday cage of electricity that has nothing to do with your own. So it's really hard to maintain um, really good cellular physiology when you, when you fly or, an, or a train or, you know, something like 
like that. Um, so when you travel somewhere, especially for sport, as soon as you get to where it is that you land, try to get outside and go for a walk or get in a park or connect with grass. It helps a ton with jet lag as well. So I tell um, everybody that travels, but particularly my athletes, when you land, find the nearest park and get outside for 30 to 90 minutes and just to help get your blood to flow better and improve your uh, physiology. And it makes a huge difference from recovery from travel. Wow, very cool. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone listening to this video uh, found our chat very interesting. So thank you again for taking the time to sit with me and relay all this amazing information. My pleasure. I, I, I love sharing what I know. I love learning more. So I like watching your, um, your little podcast stuff that you do as well. It's always cool to hear different athletes from different sports. And, and I love that you are focused on women in sport because I think that um, uh, it's such a huge field that gets neglected a lot. So I appreciate what you're doing as well, Eliana. Thank you so much. Uh, well, it was great talking to you. You too. Good luck. Oh,